The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking some time out of your busy schedules to listen to our Denison webinar called Fast Actions and Solutions Teams. My name is Alice Westag, and I'm a client manager at Denison Consulting. I'm joined here today by our presenter, Alan Barr, who is a senior consultant at Denison, as well as the CEO and chief catalyst of Creative Change Associates. A couple things before we start our webinar. Alan's presentation will be about 30 minutes long, and then we're going to have some time to respond to any questions <laughs> that you have. So we strongly encourage you to submit your questions as the presentation is going so we can go ahead and organize those for the question and answer session at the end. Uh, to submit a question, you can use the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. I do apologize in advance because we typically don't have enough time to answer all of your questions, but we will be sure to follow up with you after the presentation if we do not address your specific question. So without any further delay, I am pleased to introduce to you Mr. Alan Barr. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. It really is a pleasure to be able to speak with all of you today about a topic that is really near and dear to my heart, action teams. Teamwork consumes me. I really think about collaboration and leadership and change processes all of the time, and I really believe that teams are the absolute fastest, best way to help drive action in any type of change situation. My hope today is that you'll all get something out of this webinar that you can take back to your organizations and use right away that it becomes useful information and a good use of your time. In my 25 or so years of working with leaders and organizations helping to implement culture change and transformation, I really have come to believe that teamwork is where it's at. I've also come to believe that most organizations don't really know how to take survey results, diagnostic data, assessment data, and turn that into action. How do you really go from assessment to action quickly and effectively? I think teams are absolutely the best way to do that. So as Alice had said in the introduction, please think about any issues, questions, or problems that you might have around teams and collaboration and send those questions in as we go throughout the webinar. If you have questions about your own process or how to drive collaboration in your system, please let me know and we'll try to answer as many questions as we can. What I'd like to do today is basically share a story. It's a case study from a team-based transformation that I worked on with the city of Ann Arbor, Michigan. And the city did some amazing things with their internal action team and we're pleased that we could share the story with all of you. So a little bit of background about the city of Ann Arbor. Ann Arbor is a college town. It's the home for the University of Michigan. And every fall, 35,000 or so students descend on the city, and parking space has become rarer than hen's teeth. And like any town and gown situation, there's a lot of give and take between the university and the city, which adds to the city's issues. Some of the other issues facing the city of Ann Arbor, as well as almost any municipality in the United States these days, due to the economic conditions, there's reduced revenue as the housing crisis continues to deepen. Less money comes in through property taxes. And so, as you might imagine, there's also greater political pressure to maintain service and cut costs. Over the last four or so years, the city has gone through major restructuring. It's reduced its employee base from about 1,400 to uh, somewhere now less than 800. So it's almost cut its employees in half. It's reduced its executive or decision-making level from 36 to 6. And whenever you take that many people out of the system, you typically don't take all of the work they used to do out of the system. And so now you've got the same amount of work, fewer people, much more stress, it tends to drive morale down, it tends to start to impact how people relate with each other, how they collaborate or cooperate, and it really takes a stressful situation and makes it even more so. And the city administrator who came at the start of this restructuring period about four or four and a half years ago decided that he really wanted to leave a legacy different than just 
cutting employees and restructuring the physical functioning of the city. He really wanted to change the culture. He wanted to instill a culture of collaboration and teamwork. And he wanted to leave the city of Ann Arbor as one of the absolute best municipalities anywhere on the planet. In 2005, the city had taken the Denison Organizational Culture Survey. And just a bit of information on how to interpret this particular slide. With the Denison Culture Survey, more color is better. The more color that you see, the more that there's alignment, the more that there's strength in those particular areas. And so if more color is better, when you look at this particular slide, one of the things you'll notice is that there's not a lot of color. Well, this is a little bit of bad news and good news. Um, the bad news is that there's an awful lot of room for improvement, and the good news is there's an awful lot of room for improvement. And besides that, they didn't have to spend a lot of money on color printing. So with this sort of as the backdrop, you might imagine people were a little shocked at seeing scores like this. And so coming out of the assessment process, the city adopted a unit-by-unit unit approach to taking this data and doing something with it. They had at the time just over 67 work units across the city, and they used 67 different approaches. Each unit was left to pretty much figure out on its own what the issues were, what it could do, and then to do something to try to fix it. And the basic message that was delivered to everybody across all of these business units was, you're broken, go fix yourselves. Probably didn't play as well as people might have thought. Uh, there was a lot of resistance. People didn't feel very good about that message. And a lot of folks who weren't used to driving change and transformation suddenly found themselves in the position of having to do just that. And so lots and lots of conversation, lots of effort, but very little impact. All of this led to higher frustration, started to impact morale, drive that down, and ultimately started to take what used to be fairly decent cooperation across these work units and make it more of a competitive nature. Work units and people started to figure out, hey, we might be next on the chopping block. Let's not do anything to mess that up. We want to be the ones that survive. And so it started to create a little competition inside of the, the city as well. So, in late 2006, the city administrator decided that they needed to retake the survey, and they really wanted to do things differently this time. He contacted Dan Dennison, the founder and uh, CEO of Dennison Consulting, and asked Dan, well, what do we need to do differently this time to make a difference, to show more progress, to have more success? And one of the things that Dan suggested was, well, you should probably think about bringing in an external objective consultant who is familiar with working with teams and can help you really drive some change. And Dan recommended me, and that's how I got involved with this project. So in 2007, they retook the survey. And you can see the comparison here on the left-hand side from 2005, on the right-hand side from 07. And, and if you're looking at that and saying, what's the difference? Um, basically, not much. They look amazingly similar. If more color is better, you don't really see more color on this. And if you look at the bottom of the picture, you'll see on the left-hand side that 695 folks participated in the survey process in 2005, and over 100 fewer folks participated in 2007. Now, some of this is due to the fact that there were a few less employees across the city. Some of this, though, because this is a voluntary survey process, is that folks were feeling less good about participating because nothing had been done that they could tell coming out of 2005. I helped the city understand that we needed to use a different process coming out of this survey round. We decided that we needed to use a whole systems approach. We decided that really, you know, if you think about this city, it's a system by itself. We can't treat each one of the different units as a separate 
living, breathing entity all into its own. It all fits together, and it all works together to provide service to the citizens, and so we need to think about it as a whole. Seven of the units across the city had shown some progress in the two years that they had been doing things, had been working on improving. And so what we really wanted to do was find out from them, how did you do that? What is it that your leadership did that was different? How did you work with each other? How did you collaborate differently? Did you share information differently? What was it that caused you to be successful when your sister unions across the city weren't as successful? And so we really wanted to find out if there were things, some strengths, some, some ideas that we could take and use as best practices and share across the city. We pulled together an internal team of change agents and facilitators. It's folks who were very interested in helping to drive change and make some positive progress in the city. And so we pulled together about 15 folks and we decided that we wanted to really um, start to train these folks to be internal consultants and to really help become permanent resources for the city. And the other thing that was different is that they would have me throughout the process. They'd have external support that was objective, that could help speak truth to power, that could help understand what really was happening and had some experience with both teams and change. And so I could coach and mentor both the internal team and the decision makers as we went through the process. I had mentioned that we had seven units that had done um, better coming out of the 2005 survey and, and had done some things over two years to show some progress. So we did a couple of things right after the survey. The very first thing we did is that we debriefed every single unit across the city. We scheduled and held 67 conversations with each one of the work units and all of their folks to say, here's what the survey said, here's what you said, here's what we think you're telling us. Help us understand exactly what you mean by this and, and what you think is behind some of these things. Here's what we see are some of the main themes coming out of this. What do you see? And the advantages of this were that everybody, every employee got a chance to hear from myself and from the internal change team. Here's what we're hearing. Here's what we're seeing. And we started to engage all of the employees as a whole. We also, at the same time, at each one of these debriefs with the 67 units started to collect information about the significant themes that, that started to pop from the survey data. And those were communication and engagement. We started to find out from folks, well, what sort of information do you need to be successful and to do your work to the best of your capability? What's the best way to get that sort of information to you? And we started to find out from them what it would take to get Unmuted. everybody the same sets questions and collected some more information that would help feed our, our process. And then for each one of those seven units that had shown progress, we conducted a focus group. We asked them a lot of questions around leadership and communication and engagement so that we could learn what was working in the city system and, and we could find ways to start to share that with everybody else. And we learned a ton of phenomenal information that way that we would never have learned otherwise. So how did this work? You know, this all sounds great. What were the results? Well, we started to work with a couple of teams, one of which was customer service. And this is an example of some of the progress we were able to make in a very short period of time. On the left-hand side, you can see where that unit started in 2005 with their survey results. And on the right-hand side, you can see after we had worked with them for a few months and resurveyed them to see if we were making progress, what sort of progress we had made. Now remember, more color is better. And when you look at this, you'll see a lot more color on the right-hand side. In fact, you'll see more color in each one of the 12 indices or areas of the survey. And so this started to show us we were doing the right things. We were making progress in every area. And I think the most exciting piece to this is if you look on the bottom again of the slide, on the left-hand side, 11 people from this unit decided they felt safe enough and, and comfortable enough to take the survey in 2005. When we resurveyed after working with them a little bit in 2008, three more people decided to opt in. And so we were really beginning to make progress and engage more people. And so this is another way to show that we were making progress in transforming the culture, how people thought, how people felt, how people behaved. 
And this was phenomenal news. And so these are some hard measures that help show that we made some progress. We've also got some really lovely and tangible measures. Things like enviro scanning. Um, we've got the internal team now looking at the environment and finding out both inside and outside of the city proper what's happening. What are people thinking? What are people saying? What are some of the threats and opportunities that are happening that we need to be aware of, that we need to get to the decision makers so that they can make better, safer decisions? We've now got a leadership development process where this internal team serves as a way to take folks that are potentially uh, promotable to supervisory and management positions and gives them experience in a citywide effort that cuts across all of the service areas and all of the work units and lets them see how can a group of people help drive positive change in an organization. We've got much higher morale and shared positive thinking. And we know this because one of the things that the city does, the city manager or the city administrator had done, is he had set up regular management meetings where the 150 or so supervisors and managers and executives would get together on a regular basis and talk about issues affecting the city. And one of the questions he asked at one of these sessions was, hey, how, how do I know, how do you know if this is working? Are there things that you can say or talk about that start to show us that we're maybe making some progress? What's different? And some of the comments that we heard back were, that it's not just management now reaching out, everybody's looking to get engaged. Frontline employees, supervisors, everyone. Folks started to talk about bottlenecks opening up, that they were seeing things starting to work from a whole organizational point of view. Folks started to share that, you know, in previous years, the role of the gatekeeper or bottleneck was tolerated, that it was okay to block progress, and now it's no longer tolerated, that folks were working to remove every bottleneck and to work through those issues and make sure that things were working. Folks were no longer hearing, well, we've always done it that way. More and more folks were becoming open to change. And, you know, maybe one of the most uh, astounding ones was that somebody said in the last 12 months we've moved from polite distance to collaboration. And that was a real eye-opener for many folks that we were making a positive change in this culture. So we've talked about the basic process. We've talked about some of the results, both the measurable and, and unmeasurable and tangibles, how did we really start to drive this change? Well, I believe there were 10 critical things that we did that we thought of and, and implemented as a way to build this action team. And so you'll see them here. We reached some significant agreements with the city administrator. We pulled together this internal action team. We trained the team. We scheduled regular team meetings and Part of that process was also then developing some really critical, absolutely fundamental team values and norms. We really decided to leverage the team street cred, and I'll talk more about that in a minute or two. We created what I call a pull system, where people started to pull us into the process rather than pushing into the, the organization. We, we, right from the start, built in continuous improvement and quarterly check-ins. And we also designed the team and its process with sustainability in mind. And so I think these 10 things are so important that I'd like to talk about each one of them for a moment individually. When I say that we reached some agreements with the city administrator, with the sponsor, I'm talking about some pretty serious agreements. One of the things that I asked for and, and literally demanded was that within 24 hours of my requesting a meeting, I would have a face-to-face -face conversation with him that would last for at least 30 minutes, that he would clear and he would have his admin clear on his schedule, 30 minutes of time within 24 hours of my asking for it. If I ran into a problem, if the team ran into a barrier, if something was going to slow down our progress, we could have that kind of a conversation within 24 hours. And he agreed that this was important enough to him and to the organization and that he would help remove any barriers any obstacles that we ran across. And that was a wonderful thing to help start this process. And we also had a lot of frank conversation around his vision of success. What were the outcomes that he really wanted to see? If, if when the day was done, when this effort was sort of wrapping up, what were the things that had to be in place that he would say would lead this to be a success? What were his big, hairy, audacious goals? 
I spoke about the internal action team, the 15 employees that we pulled together. They were a cross-functional, cross-level group. We had frontline workers, uh, we had supervisors, we had managers from all across the city. Every major service area was represented. And this helped us leverage all of their relationships and their credibility, their street cred. These are folks that worked with everybody across the city that, that knew each other, that knew the folks in all of these work units, and vice versa. And so people had some just natural trust, some natural belief that, hey, they have our best interest in mind. And we wanted to make sure that we could leverage that right from the start. And we also wanted to make sure that we could leverage their knowledge of the system. Again, these are folks that live and work in this system. And they know how things work. And they know maybe even more importantly what doesn't work. And so they could help me and the rest of the team help figure out how not to make certain mistakes and what might work better. And so this was a huge advantage as we started to move forward. I think that one of the first things that we did with the team that really set the tone for the duration of the process was we pulled them off into a two-day off-site on neutral ground. We went someplace that was not city property and we had some very honest conversations. We talked about what was working and what didn't work and what the different politics were across the city that we needed to pay attention to and what relationships needed to be improved and what trust was like in different places. And this could only be possible on neutral ground um, where it's safe to really talk about these sorts of things. And these two days were enough time to really start to get to know each other, both uh, as individual team members and me kind of as the new person coming in from outside. And so we used this time to build relationships and to build some trust. And we also used this time to provide some training and some skill development and some things they would need to be able to do as a team helping to drive change. Things like problem solving and prioritization because there's always going to be too much to do and never quite enough time to do it all. And so how do we determine what to do first and second and third and what gives us the best bang for the buck. And we talked about communication and set up some thoughts and some processes around that. What information should we share with each other and with the rest of the city and what information would we need to continue to gather from folks. And so this was very, very helpful as we started to move forward. And this in turn really started to boost the team members' confidence. They started to have more confidence in themselves because suddenly there was more of a process in place and there was more time that was spent in training them. And they had confidence in me as, as a consultant coming in from the outside to help them because I was spending time working with them and helping them before sending them off to go help others. And this confidence and trust goes a long, long way when you're working with a team to help them hit the ground running hard and fast. While we were together at this offsite, another thing that we did that I think was hugely helpful is we scheduled out for the next year regular team meetings. We found a day and a time every month and put it in everybody's calendar for the next 12 months where the team would get together for at least two hours and could spend time together as a team. That's really how you be a team is that you spend time together working on issues. And we, again, kept these meetings on neutral ground so it was safe. We could talk about really risky, tough things without fear of somehow being found out or being punished. And this allowed everybody to understand that we would also have, have continuous learning and we would keep coming together to support each other as a team. And in terms of the continuous learning, we built into every one of these ongoing team meetings discussions about what was working and what wasn't working from each person's perspective and experience so that we could do some real-time learning from each other and shift on the fly, make changes as we go. We also would put in some topical training as things became apparent that we'd need training in X or we'd need training in Y, we could provide it. We had the time set aside to do these little mini trainings so that there was continuous skill building and continuous learning going on. And for the very first time in their experience, every team member could count on regular interactions with their fellow team members and with me. And this too starts to build confidence and trust 
that this is going to be different. This is going to be a team. We are all going to be together and we'll be helping each other. None of us is in this alone. And so that was huge in terms of helping them with their confidence and giving them the courage it takes to go and do these kinds of things with their peers across the city. As part of all of these conversations and in every ongoing conversation, we started to talk about the values, the norms, the sort of fundamentals for how we're going to be as a team. And so we talked about the explicit do's and don'ts. We will do this. We won't do that. Things like what's said in the room stays in the rooms, so that we could have those brutally honest conversations without getting into trouble, so to speak. And as we went through the process, we kept reinforcing these at every team meeting, at every interaction I might have with someone. And we took opportunities from all of these interactions to really learn and to use all, any teachable moment we could find. And these really became the bedrock for our team behavior. You know, what we're going to do, how we'll take care of each other. This really helps determine what's in and what's out and makes it really safe for people to really be full participatory members of a team. This really, if you think about it, defines the shared expectations we have of each other. And that's crit critical for working together. We created what I call a pull system. You know, if you think about pulling and pushing, it's always easier to pull than to push. If you are trying to make decisions, drive change in an organization, if you force it on people, if you push it on people, the natural reaction is to push back, to get defensive, and to not like that. And so we didn't want that to happen. We didn't want people to feel as if they had to push back on anything we were doing. So what we really wanted was somebody to pull us in. We used, again, the credibility, the trust that the internal team members had by sending them out to ask peers across the city, hey, does anybody want some help? Is there anybody, any unit that could use some help with some of these issues? And we got a unit that said, yeah, we're pretty frustrated. We could use some help. Would you come talk with us? And so we had an early adopter that pulled us in. This really, really helped us. And it gave us some specific work to do very fast and also started to create some magic because as we started to show some progress with this unit, they started to talk with their fellow workers across the city. And so not only were the team and I sharing good news and communicating, we now had a client, so to speak, within the city that was also sharing some good news. Hey, this team is good. They are helping us. You do need to contact them. And before we knew it, we had a second unit and a third unit and then a fourth unit that had called or raised their hand or had emailed and said, please, please, give us a hand too. We'd like to get some of that. And so we really leveraged that success from the first group and used that to create an ongoing pull system. And so now you've really got some momentum when units across the city are starting to ask for help. And the team can feel better about its success. Everybody can start to feel better that, hey, this is going to be different, and it is going to work this time. And no pushing is necessary. If you think about any kind of a team, whether it's a church choir, whether it's a symphony orchestra, whether it's a sports team of some kind, you know, it's hockey season and the Red Wings are in the playoffs. Every team needs to spend time continuously upgrading its skills to continuously learn, not only from each other, but from its coach. And so we built all of that stuff into the process. Every team meeting had time set aside or space set aside for a little mini training session. And what's working and what's not working sorts of learnings. Any coaching or mentoring that I did with individual team members had that sort of conversation intentionally built into it. So that, that every time, every week, every month, we continued to sort of upgrade the skill set. We continued to learn. We continued to get better. And not only does this make you more effective, it also starts to make you more confident. It makes you more bolder. And when you're bolder, it really gives you the kind of courage to take on more and more of the change work that's necessary to transform any kind of system. So all of this, this continuous learning and coaching and mentoring from each other and from myself, again, started to build more and more trust and, and stronger relationships across the team and with me. Another thing that we did from the get-go is that 
since we had an internal team of change agents that wasn't at the executive level, we wanted to make sure that we tied the executives into the process and to the team regularly. So we set aside for the next year quarterly check-in meetings where we would spend between two and four hours talking with the six executives, the city administrator and his five uh, lieutenants, and with the team. And we did several things as part of this process. We used the time to really get to know the executives and the team and to start to build that sort of mutual understanding and that mutual trust that would be necessary for everybody to work together and drive positive change across the city. The internal team really became seen by the executives as a valuable resource, a resource they wanted to continue to invest in, a resource that they wanted to continue to utilize, a resource that was really valuable to them and to the city. The executives asked the internal team to begin scanning the environment, again, that enviro scanning, inside and outside, for potential threats and opportunities, and to analyze these threats and opportunities and to feed them back to the executives so that when they made decisions, when they were forming strategies, they could take these things into account. Rather than being blindsided, they had this sort of warning system, this early warning system that was now working for them, this radar that was always searching and feeding them information. Another cool thing that happened is that the internal team became a test bed for new policies and procedures. So one of the things that happened was that, that as the executives were thinking of a new policy that they'd like to implement, they could test it on the team and find out how will this play in the field. Will people be okay with this? Are there things we should change? So if you think of this, this, this again was kind of an early warning system about success or failure on policies. So how much would this sort of environmental scanning or policy testing be of value to your organization? I would suggest it's invaluable. I talked a little bit about sustainability. We wanted to make sure that the team could be a permanent resource for the city, but wouldn't be sort of stuck, that it wouldn't develop groupthink. And so we wanted to think through a way that every year a third of the team could be replenished, could be refreshed, that we could pull new team members in. And so one of the things that we did is we as a, as a team thought through what are the sorts of individual team member characteristics that we need that, that lead to being a successful team member. So we built a list of, of those sorts of characteristics and then as a team folks started to look around their friends and coworkers to see who might be a potential candidate that matched those characteristics. So we built a list of folks that seemed to fit the profile of a successful change team. Once we had that list of potential candidates, we had one of those conversations with the executives about, hey, does this make sense? Is it okay to invite these people to be now internal change agents in this process? Is it okay with you? And will you help us with their managers and supervisors understand why this is so important? We then designed a process for bringing these folks on board the team, for training them. The two-day off-site worked so well that we built that same sort of two-day thinking, that two-day off-site into the process where the team now would spend two days with the new team members, getting them up to speed on team values and norms, on how the team works, on some of the skills that they need to be good team members. And this was vital. So now new people can be brought onto the team and a third of the team can be cycled back into their work units. So now we've got fully trained change agents that are back full time with their individual units. So this is increasing the entire city's capacity to lead and drive change and positive transformation. So as a quick summary, if you think about this as a symphony and you want to build a world-class symphony, a world-class effective internal action team, you've got to get the right conductor. You've got to find the right sort of objective external support or consulting support that makes it safe, somebody that knows how to work with the team and work with change. You've got to get the right kind of sponsorship from the top decision maker or decision makers. You've got to make sure they're on board. You've got to make sure you've got easy, fast access to them when you need their help. You've got to make sure that they're fully supportive of everything that you and the team are going to be doing, and you can't surprise them. You've got to work really hard to build the internal team, both from the start and all the way through the process. You've got to continually talk about learning and new skills and reinforcing things and making sure that you build those relationships and that trust all the way as you go. 
And lastly, but not least, you've got to communicate, communicate, communicate. You've got to communicate with the team, everybody collectively, share their learnings, bad, good, indifferent. You've got to communicate with the decision makers. You've got to communicate with everybody else across the city. Here's what we're doing. Here's what we're learning. Help us. Share with us what you're hearing and what you're learning. And so you've got to create as much communication and information sharing as is humanly possible. And so with that, what questions do you have? Thank you, Alan. We do have some questions that folks have been sending in during the course of the presentation. I thank you for um, submitting those so we can organize them for our question and answer session. Uh, our first question has to do with the survey results. How do you present survey results that are so low to the client, and what kind of reactions do you get? Well, the first thing to realize that no organization is ever perfect, and almost every time that an organization takes an assessment or a survey for the first time or two, the results are probably going to be lower than people inside the organization are going to expect. So it's not terrible news. It really is an opportunity to look at things maybe differently and to use that as a way to drive some positive change. And so we were very honest. We shared with people, hey, the results certainly aren't where we'd like them to be, but the good news is we've got some room for improvement and you've all told us some areas we need to focus on. And so now we've got a plan. We've got the external consultant. We've got the internal change team. We've really got a way to help you help yourselves and to drive drive some positive change. And so if it's just bad news, that's not very helpful. But if it's, you know, a little bit of bad news with some opportunity and some thinking on how to make it work, now you've got something you can work with and you can start to engage people with. We also got several questions about your 10 critical steps. And I'm going to start with this one. Out of the 10 critical steps, which do you think is the most important? Wow. You know, it's tough to, to maybe pick from some of those. I think in some ways the internal team paired with the external consultant is a huge thing. But maybe the, the, the single biggest thing was getting all of the agreements, including sort of the, you know, we get at least a half an hour of your time uh, top person within 24 hours. You're always going to run into problems, barriers, issues that need somebody at the top of the organization to be able to help you work through. And the fact that within 24 hours we could have that sort of a conversation and get that kind of support and help was just invaluable. And so, you know, if I guess I had to pick one, that might be it. And speaking of that 24-hour that period that you had, how often did you ask for a face-to-face -face meeting? And did you ever overuse it, underuse it? How did that work? You know, that, that's absolutely a critical question. You, you don't ever want to overuse something like that because all of a sudden if you're doing that, then you're not likely to get those sorts of face-to-face -face conversations. And the, the, it'll be taken away. So I made sure to only use it when we really needed it, when it was an issue or a problem that I or another manager across the city or, or the team couldn't solve by ourselves. And I would say that we probably used it five or maybe six times throughout the first year of the process, so about every other month. And it was really something that was absolutely critically important and would stop us dead in our tracks if he didn't at the time give us that help. And at one point with the 10 critical steps, you talk a lot about pulling rather than pushing. So it seems like you were reactive and op opportunistic in a, in a smart way. Um, how do you know when to take advantage of these opportunities rather than um, pushing people? You know, that's a, a great question. I think that it's um, something you start to get a feel for the more of this work that you do. And I think that that's a little bit of the value that externals can bring to the system, knowing exactly when to push and when to pull. But I think if there's ever a doubt, pulling is almost always to be recommended and is easier, is better, is safer for everybody. And so you really do need to look for opportunities, even if they're small. They don't have to be the highest value things to start with, but you want to get some quick success under your belt. And so if you can find anybody, any, any little piece that could use some help, and you can jump on that, you start to build some positive momentum, and you start to build confidence and trust from everybody. 
And what do you think was your biggest challenge adopting the team approach, and how did you address that challenge? The biggest challenge usually with internal teams is getting their supervisors and managers, the team members' supervisors and managers, to give them sort of up enough, give them enough time to work on these sorts of things other than their real jobs. And so that needed some help from the top executives. That, I think, is, is almost always the biggest. It certainly was in this case, was probably our first and biggest initial challenge. We've talked a lot about the team's role in this process. Can you elaborate a little more about how the team was set up? Did we have one team for the entire city, or were there teams within each of these units that you described? Again, we, we thought of the city as a whole system, and so we had one team that was really working with me to help the entire city. We had folks that we had picked from each one of the five major service areas and different levels across those service areas. So the 15 people were from all of the major service areas, and our focus really was broadly the whole city. And when we worked with units, we would go in as a whole team or a small portion of our whole team and work with each of those particular service units. So the team was from the whole city, and that really was our primary focus. Do you think there were any pros to having a team that went across the whole city? Do you think at any point it might have been useful to have teams within the units? Well, the advantages, I guess, of having one team that was focused or from the whole city is that it is one team, and it's easier to build one team than to build, for example, 67 teams. And if the city is, you know, from the citizen's point of view, they don't really know working it from working it. They just know city. And the city is an entire system. And so you could focus on those huge pieces, those common themes across all the work units and across the entire city. And you could engage every one of the single work units, the 67 different work units, around those major themes. And so I think that there were more advantages that way than, than having 67 different teams. Now, as people from work units rotated off of this internal team and went back to their work units, now those work units have somebody inside of that particular unit that's got a skill set, that's got some experience, that's got some, some training, and that'll help drive change. And so we are, in essence, ultimately seeding every unit with people that can do those things. And so at some point, that'll really happen. There was a lot of curiosity among the audience about the executives. Can you describe what the role of the executives was throughout this process? And was their role your first choice? The executives were sponsors, were the, the bottom line supporters of the process. And so they were really our barrier busters. You know, if you think about any organization, the top executives aren't likely to be fully trusted, whether rightly or wrongly, by everybody in the organization because not everybody knows them well enough. And, and you know, you tend to sort of distrust folks in power. And so having an internal team that was a step or two steps or three steps below the executive level in terms of its membership, there was a little more trust in some of those individuals than there might have been in the executives just based on position. And so I think it gives you some natural advantages if you don't really drive things fully from the executive level. And let's face it, executives are never going to probably have enough time to fully make this work. You can't really make them the worker bees, the, the real change agents themselves. They need to support it. They need to make sure that barriers get removed. They need to make sure you've got enough resources to make this work. They need to be engaged, certainly, and we did a lot of that. But I think that, that um, you know, having this sort of an internal team that's from the middle makes a lot more sense. And um, again, we made sure that the executives and the internal team had plenty of opportunity to work together, to collaborate, and to really help each other help everybody else. And so um, I don't know that I would say that I would pick the executives as my first choice. I think a, a, an internal team, the way we set it up here at the city, makes a lot more sense in almost every situation. And how do you think the process would have been different if it had been led by the top management? Um, and, and why do you think that the leadership team wasn't driving the change from the beginning? 
Well, again, it's a city, and in cities you have elected officials that supervise or, or employ the top executives. And so it's very tough in that sort of situation to maybe have the sorts of conversations and drive all of the change that you might like to drive. And so the ability to have an external objective person like myself in an internal team that isn't reporting to the elected officials directly allows you to really start to focus on things that you might not be able to do otherwise. And so there are some advantages there. And again, you know, it's pretty tough to, if you're the, you know, reporting to an elected official to, you know, be fully confident that if you don't make a mistake or if you make a mistake, you know, what's my career going to be like? What's my job future like? And so I think it's safer also for an internal team, the way we set it up at the city to function. And, you know, um, it, it really worked well. The executives could provide the kind of support they could su supply and that we needed. And it was kind of a one-two punch. And I think with a one-two punch, you've got, a, you've got certainly more tools in the toolkit than if you had just the executives. And what are the roles of the executives now and, and even in the future? For example, how would you ensure that the, the next leader that, that takes place um, is going to be as passionate about, um, about this process? Is there a measure you use, or is there some other process that you use to ensure this? Well, you know, you're never fully sure if a new top executive comes in what may happen, but this is, is you know, a couple of years into the process now it's become the new norm the executives currently are very supportive they are the champions of the team they are the conveners of the team they are the ones that still meet with the internal change team every quarter the city administrator still uh, if barriers need to be busted is the person to call one of the executives is the actual official sponsor uh, so one of the top six people in that very top strategic decision-making group is one of the ones that uh, make sure that the team has enough resources, that make sure the rest of the executives are aware of what needs to happen and are fully on board and supportive. So the executives are very involved in making sure that the team is, has got the support and resources that it needs for everybody to be successful. And the fact that this is now part of how they do business would be pretty difficult for somebody to come in and change, especially since it's really working. You know, one of the ways that we know it's working is that the city just went through a very serious budget cycle. Again, revenues are shrinking, but nobody wants to cut service. In years past, if they had ever had conversations about reducing the workforce even more, the union leadership would have really fought them tooth and nail, and it might have taken years to get those kinds of changes made. In this particular situation, since everybody had, had been working together much more closely over the last couple of years, they were able to have some productive conversations and jointly decide how best to make that happen. So they didn't really bring the city to a halt, and it didn't end up in court. And I think that's an example, really, of how successful this has been and how much ingrained now in the culture this really is. So I have a belief that this is probably going to live here forever. And is there a type of organization that this process would work best in, maybe different industries, different size organizations? I don't think that there's a best one. I've used this process or, or variations of this process in huge organizations that are global, in small startups, in nonprofits, in government, in education, in high tech, in manufacturing, um, in service uh, industry organizations of all sizes. So I think that these are some pretty fundamental things that typically will work anywhere if you have the right ingredients together. And would you say that the process was more employee satisfaction driven or more business solutions driven? Certainly our focus was not employee satisfaction. It was hardline bottom business issues. We really focused on specific issues, specific problems that would help everybody. And by doing that, you bring employee satisfaction and morale up, you increase it along with that. If people are getting to solve the problems that are really keeping them from doing good work, they feel better about themselves, they feel better about the organization, and so that's just a side benefit. A 
huge side benefit, but we really focused on hard, important things, not, not satisfaction. So were there specific performance measures that you can speak to which gauge the success of the team? Yeah, absolutely. Certainly, you know, we, I talked a lot about the financial pressures on the city, and so budget issues were uh, and continue to be very strong drivers in municipal government. And those were some hard measures that each of the business units focused on, how to continue to cut cost from their process without reducing the quality of service or the speed of service. And so that was part of the issue. Um, one of the ways that the city of Ann Arbor has, has been able to maintain or even increase its service level, even though it's reduced headcount and reduced uh, budgets over the years, is by using technology to a better extent, to better leverage how technology works. And that's part of the focus that we had too, was unit by unit, how can they better utilize some of the technologies to provide faster service, better service, lower their costs. And so those are just some of the things that we're focused on. Going back to the teams uh, for a moment, what types of structure was set up for the initial action team? Well, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by structure, but, but what we did was we uh, looked across the five main service areas, and we wanted to make sure that we had folks on the team that were from those five service areas. And we wanted also to make sure that we had folks that came from sort of different levels. So we had a manager or two, we had a supervisor or two, we had some frontline workers, so that we got as broad and as deep a perspective as we could possibly find. And so this internal team was pulled together, and this really became a part-time job for them, and they were freed up on a part-time basis to work as a team and to work with me and to work with all of the other units across the city. And so I'm hopeful that I'm answering the question that you want. And for teams that are already established, how difficult is it to turn around a dysfunctional team that maybe has some mixed personalities? And um, is there a particular barrier that needs to be removed in order to do this? Well, for intact teams, and, and uh, you know, there are times when on a team somebody just doesn't fit, and you may need to have that kind of a conversation with the decision makers or with the team members. I'm almost always of the opinion that, you know, if you can get the team sort of refocused on one or two things that are vitally important, you can get them a little bit of confidence by, you know, we are going to do things a little differently. You'll get a little different level of support this time. I'm here with you. You know, one of the promises that I personally make to a team is I will not let you fail. Whatever it takes, I will be there for you, you know, because you're my peeps, right? So let's work together. And, and that starts to give them some confidence, and it starts to shift a little bit of the internal dynamic because now, you know, we don't have to maybe fight each other if things are bad. We're going to fix things, and we've got some help, and we've got some support. So some of it may be as easy as some of that. Great, Alan. We have one final question um, before we start to wrap up. The question is, how do um, employees or these teams report their progress to their fellow employees? Well, again, my belief is that transparency and honesty and openness is huge in any process like this. And so the first thing that we would do is to, is to set up some kind of communication system. So is there a team newsletter or an organizational newsletter where the team could share information? Is there an internal web, an intranet, where the team could post what it's doing? You know, how can we continue to communicate with all of the units across an organization or all of the pieces of across an organization and you need to find some ways to do that and certainly some of that can be formal as I said through newsletters and through internet some of it can be as simple as informal you know people just talking with others sharing the good news and what starts to happen when you make this sort of progress is folks that aren't even on the team but those that are getting some of this help seeing some of this progress start sharing the good news with each other and so you build in an informal communication network that starts to share good news instead of just the bad news that might get shared through a grapevine. And so I think that you need to think through how information flows as you 
start a process like this and things that you can do to help that along. So it's got to be an intentional process. Well, folks, my time is up. I really want to thank all of you for participating in today's webinar. I'd really also like to thank the whole team from Denison. Dan Denison, uh, Jay Richards, Nabil Susu, Alice Wasteg, Rossi Roshkoff, and Karen Luce for helping me uh, get this webinar ready and for hosting it and letting me speak with all of you. And before I go, I have an offer I'd like to make to everybody who's participated today. This is important enough to me that I want to make sure you're successful if you're serious about trying teams or collaborative processes in your, your work. So what I will let you do is I will give you free access to some of the tools that we created and I've used over the 20 years or so to help teams collaborate. And I will also provide to you an hour of free coaching if you're really serious about using tools and pulling a team together and trying to make some positive change. I'll give you an hour's worth of my time to help you think through or plan how that might work. So to uh, get that, all you have to do is contact me and let me know you're interested and we'll go from there. So again, thanks everybody and have a great day. Thank you, Alan. We also really appreciate having you here and taking the time out of your day to share with us your experiences and expertise in solutions teams. For those of you listening out there, I strongly encourage you to take Alan up on his offer. If you want to learn more about Alan, you can also contact us um, and uh, learn about the work he's done and maybe how he can help you. On a final note, our next webinar is going to be June 24th, and it's featuring Jim Andrews from NASA. So please keep an eye out for more information on that webinar. We hope to see you all back for that presentation. Once again, we really appreciate your time and look forward to seeing you in our webinar in the future.